Hello, Mark. Oh, wait a sec. Here comes David. All right. I'm still bringing, bringing, helping people in. We're still waiting for Doreen. There's David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi. How you doing? Welcome back. Hi. Hi there. Hey, everybody. Hi, neighbor. Hi, Hi Miriam. Yeah. We're all neighbors, aren't we? We are, but Miriam, uh, the, most of the time, lives in the same build. Oh, we're in the same neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. Yeah. So. And I'm sorry, I'm not even sure. What's the name of the gentleman uh, whose name here is Brick J.S.? I'm sorry, I don't recognize you, sir. Uh, thank you for calling me a gentleman. Uh, I'm a friend <laughs> of Doreen, and my name is Jay Brickman. Fantastic, Jay. Delighted you could join us. Thank you for the invitation. With pleasure. And uh, ben, are you, are you, are you, uh, Jay, are you here on the beach or are you elsewhere? Um, not on the beach, but I'm over um, in Northeast Miami. Fantastic. Well, uh, very welcome. And if you want to continue uh, with our Zoom meetings and, and when things open back up at the Wolfsonian Museum, uh, hopefully by fall time, we'll be meeting in person. So if you like this evening, feel free to keep on joining us. Great. I hope we can do that. And so I think we're waiting for Doreen, right? We, we are. So let me see if she is held up. So while, while, while I'm contacting Doreen, uh, since, since perhaps not everyone knows each other, particularly as, as Jay just joined us, did, do you want, does everyone want to take an, a brief opportunity to introduce themselves and say how they're holding up? Good idea. So go well, ahead. Don't, don't be shy. You want to start, Ben? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm going to try to call Doreen, so you guys go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, things are obviously uh, re re repetitious and <laughs> monotonous. And uh, however, with the fact that things are getting so much worse here in Florida, we just don't, we don't go out at all. I mean, I, I've been taking to going to Publix at 7 a.m., which they're now open at 7, mm -hmm. and the store is pretty much empty. And I do that twice a week. And then Trader Joe's go at nine when anybody over 65 can get in for an hour and it's empty and restocked. So that's good. And uh, make sure you come back to receive the message. Thank you. What's that? No. Somebody was saying something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's all. I love I love this book. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm Miriam. I'm uh, sequestered up here in New Hampshire. There's not as many cases. Uh, we have a place in Florida in, in David's uh, building right on Meridian, where Robert also lives uh, on Meridian. And how am I uh, bearing up? Well, I don't go I don't go many places. I get to the supermarket and I go out for my walk. Uh, and I think what what comes home to me is that uh, we just don't know when there this is going to end, and uh, uh, we're very hesitant about going to Florida yeah. uh, because of the alarming news that keeps coming up and and what we feel is the lack of leadership. So here we are li living a simple life. Uh, my husband had just had knee replacement surgery on Wednesday, so we're very occupied with that, but he's doing absolutely fine. Just Great. Fine. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Hi, Miriam. Are you writing a lot? Uh, so, so. I'm writing a lot in my notebook. Uh, I'm doing watercolor, and I'm doing a lot of gardening. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, lots of gardening. Sounds great. Where, where in New Hampshire are you? Concord, smallest state capital in America. I know, I know Concord. No Concord? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had all sorts of plans for this summer. We, because we, we, we rented an entire house with a little apartment up and we had visions of all these people coming to visit. 
Oh. And who knows, Robert, you might have been one of them. I you would know? love <laughs> that. But we can't do that. Maybe in the future we'll think about that. I know. Yeah. We have to think about possibilities for the future. Yes, really yes. Fun. Mark, what's going on with you? Is Mark still? I think my internet is unstable. So if, if you all have trouble hearing me, it's kind of coming in and out. Um, we are also getting ready to go north, uh, flee north to, uh, to Maine uh, for next uh, six weeks or so. And, uh, you know, so I'm looking forward to getting back to the, the cool summer, which we like to do. Um, and uh, I love this book. Uh, I listened to it on an audio book on a long trip, actually, uh, uh, between Maine and Florida uh, a few years ago. And I've listened to about half of it now again. So I'm going to be more quiet today. And, uh, but I love it, the book, so I really am interested to hear what other people have to say about it. Uh, I've been relishing it, but I'm, I, I only have half the picture now. And, I'm pleasantly surprised by what I hear. Hi, hi, hi Doreen. Hi, guys. How I'm you doing? so terribly sorry. I got confused. I thought it was 7.30, and my class just finished. And I got a glass of water, and then I was like, oh, no, it's 7. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Great to have you. We were just going around. Everyone was, was saying how they're doing, their name. Uh, thank you so much for inviting your, your friend, Jay, and, and maybe we'll let Jay uh, introduce himself and say how he's doing. Um, sure. Uh, I'm Jay Berkman, and um, I'm with a company, uh, a shipping company called Crowley Maritime. Um, we are sort of a paradoxically ex a very difficult situation and extraordinarily busy at the same time. Um, so while we're somewhat cloistered, uh, obviously, ships are coming in and going out, and we have dock operations and stevedoring and so on and so forth. So um, we've been we've been quite busy. Um, one sort of interesting thing, maybe on a sidelight, on specifically on on the heart of lonely of the lonely hunter or of a lonely hunter. Um, I guess I bring in three kinds of perhaps background on this one uh, my great uncle was a Trotskyite um, who left Russia when when Trotsky was forced to leave in his confrontation with Stalin so um, I, I got somewhat of a somewhat of a course in socialism um, on the other hand uh, I was raised in Mobile Alabama during the 1950s which was not terribly different than Columbus Georgia in 1930 so that's another sort of interesting parallel in this book. And then the third one, um, as an undergraduate at the uh, University of Florida, when I wrote my senior thesis, it was on race relations in Southern towns. Um, <laughs> so all kinds, of, all kinds of interesting things came up as I was reading the book. It was a very interesting book to read. Great. Well, Doreen, I see you brought a, like a secret uh, a expert to join our group this evening. That's wonderful. <laughs> Jay and I have known each other since the 1980s. Ben. And uh, we share a love of, of books, but he doesn't live in the area. And, but this being a Zoom meeting made it very convenient. Well, I invited him to join us when we go back live and in person in the fall, if all goes well. So let's keep on awesome. going because we want to get to the books. And Melissa, so good to see you. Uh, great. Uh, say hello, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa, and I, um, I live on Meridian, too, so the same street as several <laughs> of you. Um, I teach at the University of Miami, so we're face-to-face, -face, then we're online, then we're face-to-face. -face. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall. And um, as far as this book goes, I read it many years ago and loved, loved it. But then when I just read it again this last week, I forgot how wonderful it was and was reminded what a gorgeous, wonderful book this was. And thanks for having me here. I'm great. I'm happy to be with y'all. And that was thanks to David and Mark. They invited me. Great. Look forward to many more. Yeah. Things are getting better and better. But David, how about how are you doing down there? I'm doing great. Uh, they're 11 pounds heavier, and it's not all on my big hair, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, 
there other than uh, uh, the about the cabin fever I can't complain um, uh, they're um, they're looking forward to things opening up again I have to say and Mark uh, I'm sorry about Ben the dog I heard oh did you not hear Mark's dog died. I oh. Oh, so. Very oh, good. Yes. My faithful companion of the last dozen years. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, it was. it's hard for our little family. Uh, so it was very nice of you to say that. Well, everyone, my, my name's Ben, and uh, uh, I've been blessed to, to come to these book club meetings for about 12 years now. Um, in general, at this time of year, I'd be down in Brazil, but as uh, I have a, an elderly dog who's turning 15 this month, uh, I won't go to Brazil without him, and no airlines are flying Czech pets anywhere, domestically or internationally. So I'm afraid you're stuck with me here in Miami for a little bit longer this summer, and I'll see when I can uh, head down, if at all, this summer. But I'm delighted to be here and glad we can all join from wherever we are. So, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doreen. It, it, it's her meeting, and uh, uh, as she very kindly came up with a great list of, of uh, questions, and uh, I'm sorry if I didn't get those questions out to everyone here. Hopefully, the person who invited you was able to forward the questions and, and, and suggested topics on to you. Um, and if Doreen wants to, I mean, uh, what we traditionally do is let everyone give their brief idea or, or top line of, of whether they like the book or not and why or why not. But Doreen, it's all yours. Thank, thanks for suggesting a great book and getting us all together today. Well, thanks everyone for coming. And I knew nothing about this book before I read it, except that I hadn't read it and it was famous. And um, because it was in the time period of the Wolfsonian Museum, I suggested it with very little knowledge about it at, at all. So um, I guess just wanted to bring one thing to everyone's attention is that Carson McCullers wrote this when she was 23 years old, which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, it was published in 1940, so that was 80 years ago. And um, let's go around and give our top line. I'll give mine. I was so moved at how relevant it was 80 years later. And I was also so moved by how eloquent she was, how compassionate and empathetic at such a young age. So um, Ben, do you wanna kick it off and then we'll go around? Certainly. Uh so uh, I, I love the book. Uh, I, I classify it as a Southern Gothic novel um, with, with, with all these incredible characters. Um, and, uh, and, and the character who completely uh, took me away, obviously, or, or, or was Mick. And I, I compare her to, to for instance, a, scout, a scout finch of uh, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, I also compare it to the coming of age of Joe in, in the book Little Women that we just recently read for this club. Um, I find the author incredible. I also, I, I found it in, in, entirely precocious and that she avoided stereotypes. So, so she, she seemed to go quite in depth to each of these characters who have a lot of pluses and minuses uh, in a really interesting way. So. And, and, and I just will add, I mean, adding the, uh, the genre of Southern Gothic, you know, I will say, um, uh, um, uh, well, who am I thinking of? The... Flannery? Yeah. Well, no, actually, no, uh, Faulkner. Faulkner, <laughs> of course, is, is, is for me the, 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 main, the main man there. Uh, and he does take similar subject matter and he, he, in my view, he takes it to an even, because he's, he's an incredible writer, he transcends it to an even larger human level. So, but, I, but considering that, I'm still in awe of, of uh, Carson's work and enjoy, and I really look forward to hearing more about it from others. Um, is it Miriam? Yes, hi there. Great, okay, I'll, I have a few things to say. I was very, very interested in the book and uh, 
I was most interested in the character of Singer who cannot speak. And I thought that was an, an extraordinary device that McCullers used, that he was the sounding board. He also, he, he was this incredibly calm presence and of course the great, great listener so that the very other characters could come into his apartment and into his presence as if they were uh, coming into a, uh, arriving at a very calm island. And it caused me to think that there are very, very few situations, except maybe if you're paying for a therapist in which you will get <laughs> what seems like a completely undivided attention. And I was also interested in him as a figure of love because where he's most active is in his loving uh, connection to Spiros. And it caused me to think a lot and about this. Spiros is the most unappetizing person. And he is this, he is this, he's this Greek Southern grotesque and singer is this very, really fastidious person. And I was very, very moved that when Singer goes to see him, he, he takes these great pains with the presence and bringing him choice things. And you could say to yourself, is this a worthy object of love for someone like Singer, who, who seems to be you know, a figure of tremendous purity? I thought there was also something very gay about their connection. They, they live together, they walk, you know, they walk to work together. And then when Spiros dies, uh, Singer kills himself. So it, it caused me to think a lot about that and that McCullers at a very, very young age has thought a lot about love. Uh, and that the object of love doesn't have to seem either beautiful or worthy and can be, I call them the unappetizing fat person here, you know? So I'll-, I'll Beyond the odd couple. But, oh, beyond <laughs> the odd couple. Absolutely, Robert, absolutely. And, you know, drawing this complete devotion, yeah. it's complete devotion. That to me was extraordinary. I especially love when he writes and he says, it didn't matter that Spiros couldn't read. Yes. He just kept writing. He kept writing, exactly, exactly. Robert, continue please. Oh, sure. Um, absolutely. Um, it's not that I couldn't put it down. I did have to put it down periodically because it just absorbed me so much. I had to take in what I was reading. Um, there's so many avenues here that we have to discuss. We could probably have three book clubs, but um, at the, the idea of the four, which he actually does name the four, of Dr. Copeland and Jake Blount and Mick Kelly and Biff, um, they're so, um, it's just so interesting that they, they all need to suck at the same teat, but mm -hmm. they're so completely different in their needs. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody needs um, an ear, but, but Copeland doesn't really want to admit that he does, but he, but he ends up finding out that he really values it. Um, and, and talk about gay, I think that's the Jake, um, sorry, the Biff Bannon, Brannon character. I mean, the idea that he's, you know, he's got his wife's perfume and he never really probably ever had sex. They had no children. And um, he's always, he's fixated on, on Mick in, very, very interestingly, and it's never quite explained. But there's a mystery to all these people that, I found so alluring. Um, and then the, the denouement was sh sort of shocking uh, how, how they ended up, you know, um, that Mick, who I, I was so just blown away by her, her ability to, 
hear music and and absorb it and hold it and then bring regurgitate it and then develop it and and then she ends up this kind of ordinary shop girl uh, with runs in her hose i don't know and then of course singer's suicide was really shocking but i mean i i do love uh, uh flannery o'connor and um i'm i was thinking about who else oh eudora welty and that the southern gothic stuff is a treasure for me um so i was really really pleased reading this book thank you so how about david um it was marvelous so much so i read it and listened to it both <laughs> and to me what was just so mesmerizing about this is how she captured everyone's voice there uh, throughout. I mean, I really felt that that um, to, uh, as we went through the characters, I was able to inhabit those uh, the, their bodies with them and sort of walk with them throughout um, uh, there and just see how Threaten, threatening life was for each one of them. And I think that's really why uh, the, the mute is such is so beloved because once you take a voice away, you take a huge threat away from, from a person. And so he creates that safe space mm -hmm. that they're all craving for. Um, uh, I guess in some ways, without the voice, there's an absence of judgment. Yeah. Mm hmm Yep. Fabulous. Um, the other Mark. So um, <clears throat> for me, I, uh, I definitely can see that Harper Lee was really influenced by this book. I, I definitely agree with that, Ben. Um, I, but I uh, just did a quick check because I, to me, her, she's more like from what little I've read of Dostoevsky, she's got that magisterial, you know, view of things and the deep psychological insight. And I just, you know, and I, so I did a quick check and sure enough, uh, that, that was an influence on a lot of these writers. Um, but the thing, the thing that strikes me is about the first half of the book, because I, I loved it the first time, but I'm, now I'm only judging from the first half is just the just intense uh, pathos, you know, that, that she feels for, uh, there's a tenderness for all the characters and yet they're all so hopelessly, uh, you know, pathetic in a certain way that, you know, I feel like it's a real, you know, elegy to her growing up. Um, a real, a lot of complex, it's a very complex book. So, um, emotionally and I, th I think that's really something to just you know relish I, I think it's a book to just to really experience that the feeling of reading the book beautiful uh let's see jay well okay um as doreen knows i'm sort of a compulsive reader so <laughs> when i start reading something i really don't put it down so i read it very quickly and and, and thoroughly um, because I guess of my own background, I, to some degree, I, as I read it, I, I thought, wow, I resemble that remark. Um, because Columbus, Georgia in 1930 is not very different than Mobile, Alabama in 1950. Um, and then the thing that Robert mentioned about so many avenues, I, I just made a list of some of the avenues that, that I saw as I was going through the book, and, and to me, she touched on Darwinism, she touched on bipolar problems, she touched on bisexual problems, she touched on racism, she touched on miscegenation, uh, she touched on the thing of being an outsider, obviously segregation tied in with the racial situation. Um, some of probably her own reflections and struggles with her own sexual identity uh, she she uh, 
touched on dementia, on religion, and uh, it was like, good gracious. <laughs> It, there's there, there's so much in this book uh, and, and then well written on top of it. Um, and um, something that um, that Ben mentioned that kind of thinking about Faulkner and, and I guess something that you can relate to Ben, it sort of reminds me of Jorge Amado in Brazil as well. Um, because to me, he's always been sort of a Brazilian parallel to our William Faulkner. Uh, comparing the northeast of Brazil with the Mississippi Delta. So um, fast, it's a fascinating book. It, it's a very timely book. And given that it was written during the period of the 1930s, and that we're still grappling with this whole list of all of these problems, um, it's um, very incisive. And uh, she, she had a very short life, but obviously one that uh, I guess may have been somewhat difficult as she was trying to, to grapple with all of these things and, and bring some peace into her own mind with it because the book is somewhat auto autobiographical from what I've seen as well. So an extraordinarily interesting book. I'm so terribly sorry. What is your name again? Melissa. Melissa. Okay. Hi. I got, sorry, Melissa. That's Please. okay. What is your um, opinion? So, of course, I love this book, but what I loved most about it, and, and you've all been talking about this gender fluidity, which I found kind of surprising in some of it, but what, I re what really struck me was the yearning, everybody yearning for something that they're not getting, and the isolation that they had, even when they were in very busy places, like Viv was in his busy cafe, and... Um, Jake was in the busy carnival scene and Mick was in her very crowded house and yet they all felt so isolated in their lives and they kept yearning for more and that they thought they could find this find this all through the main character right and it, it, by his muteness they believed that they could right they believed they were understood from him and that was just beautiful just so nice so well written So originally, it seems, Carson McCullers thought of calling this the mute and not the heart is alone. Did I get everybody, by the way? Did I miss anyone? Okay. So originally, she was going to call this the mute, but instead, she decided to call it the heart is a lonely hunter. And apparently, the title comes from a poem by William Sharp that has the line, but my heart is a lonely hunter that hunts on a lonely hill. And so I guess my first question is, what do you make of the title? And what significance does it have for you? And do, why do you think they changed it from The Mute? And how would the title The Mute have made the book different, if at all? And that's anyone who wants to start. Please go ahead, Melissa. So I think this is one of the most beautiful titles I think of any book, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And I think if it was the, if, if the title had remained the mute, it would focus on John Singer. And it was, it, the focus wasn't on John Singer. It was on these hearts that were seeking something, right? That were yearning for something. And I think it just matches better. I'm glad the title was changed. And I think it's lovely. Yeah, and what Melissa said before about everybody being engaged in, you know, the busyness of the, the circus routine or the or the the New York cafe. At the bottom, everyone is in a lonely search because they feel so isolated and alone. And this is why they're attracted to the mute because that's they can be they can be free to to talk about what they can't talk about with anybody else. And so I agree. I think the title is perfect. The Mute would have, I mean, we probably all would have recognized what a great book it is regardless, but we wouldn't have been drawn. By the way, I, you know, she also wrote um, Member of the Wedding and there's another child that, that is very like Scout in that book also. Um, and unfortunately, I tried to find the movie. There's a movie, not the recent movie, but Ethel Waters movie, which I can't find available anywhere, but it is superb. Oh, it's just wonderful. Yeah. A movie yeah. of this book? 
No, it's of the, um, of the member, member, of the of, member of the uh -huh. wedding. And also I just watched another film version of um, Reflections in a Golden Eye, which is a rather extraordinary uh, movie. Uh, it's, I love it. I've probably seen it 10 times, but it's, um, it's really bizarre. Uh, with um, Elizabeth Taylor and Marlon Brando and Brian Keith um, and uh, Julie Harris. Did she uh, write that as well? Yes. Okay. Which is extraordinary. I read that while I was waiting for for uh, this book coming. Uh, it was on hold at the library. Uh, <laughs> on, I read that. It's extraordinary. And she really does, I mean, uh, they're from all of the three uh, Reflections, uh, a member of the wedding in this book. It's all about outsiders, mm -hmm. outsiders in very tight cliques. Yeah. Um, in that, she resembles Flannery O'Connor. I mean, there's there's nothing big town about Flannery either. Mm -hmm. They're all like you know, round the corner folks. I could comment on the on the title. The heart is a lonely hunter. It was a very fine title. Uh, you can't help thinking of Plato, the desire and pursuit of the whole, that somehow or other we come into this incomplete sense of ourselves and the, we have a hunger to be completed, to become whole. And, and in order to do that, we have to find another to unite with. So uh, it has a lot to do with that. I, also about the title, I think it was probably a, a publisher's uh, nudged her to find a better title than The Mute. Of course, Dostoevsky's titled The Idiot. No publisher stopped him from, you know, publishing a novel under that title. But I think for for the, the publisher felt, oh, the, that's going to be a turnoff for readers uh, and maybe direct them to a different, a, a different focus. Um, so that hunger to be united with the other and become complete. And certainly the characters do have that hunger. If I can, I'd, I'd just like to add uh, on top of what everyone has, has already said that I think the title was brilliant. And, and uh, pulling into some discussions of love such as that Miriam spoke before, the book seems to be about unrequited unre love. Mm -hmm. Right, and, uh, and I go back, there's a, a uh, here in the paperback version, page 322, it's talking about Singer, and sometimes he thought of Antotomopoulos with awe and self-abatement, sometimes with pride, always with love, unchecked by criticism, freed of will. And, and what it comes down to is that Singer loved Spiros, and it was pretty much unrequited. And the quad loved and projected all sorts of things onto Singer. <laughs> and obviously that was unrequited too. And, and what it gets at to me is that the book has a very subtle spiritual uh, un, you know, uh, side to it, that people are looking for love in the wrong place, which is a little bit like people you know, going to try to buy milk in whatever, a bookstore. So that they're they're just not going to the source; they're going to all sorts of other places. Would anyone else, I, Jay? I guess I wonder about that a little bit, given that ultimately um, the author went through, I guess, two failed marriages, and then ultimately ended up uh, in a successful relationship, uh, a lesbian relationship that maybe part of the unrequited part is that she herself was looking for her own identity and, and manifesting that somewhat through her own character, that she couldn't quite identify where she wanted to be, so she couldn't quite identify where they should be either. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe part of it could be a reflection of, of the, the, her internal trauma, which was probably even greater in 1930 than we can imagine today. Mm -hmm. I want to just add one thing about the in defense of the title, The Mute. 
mm -hmm. um, to point out that uh, mute, the mute is not just a noun, but it's an adjective. And in that sense, it is also, it's a much, it, I like the other title much better. You know, it's more evocative and it's more poetic. But this one also has some depth to it if you think about what it means if all of her characters are considered mute. What do you mean by that, Mark, if they're all considered mute? Well, I, th I think if you're talking about the mute, it means either the mute guy or that all, of, that all of these people are mute in some way. They all have some dimension that they're unable to voice. And it's only by talk, it's only in talking to, the, you know, in certain contexts that they're able to kind of voice the real deeper feelings and, and find their wholeness and their, you know, by, by when you refrain from that, when they all repress this, these emotional truths, they're all incomplete and, and lonely in some way. Uh, so and inarticulate, like they're inner, um, unable to you know, articulate the their desire. Almost, they were, I mean, and the music, the role of music is also, I think, related to that. The fact that music is so liberating for the young um, Carson McCullers character. Uh, uh, yeah, it's almost each personality is really a facade, and the facade keeps them from really, I think, understanding what they want to love and so forth. Mostly the doctor, I mean. Of all the the um, characters in here, the one uh, my heart went out to him, who was so hard on himself, therefore to on his children and everyone around him. Um, what uh, you know, and and clearly uh, he does not. He, he wants to reach out to his children. He wants the, them to love him, but he does not know how to love them first. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, I, considering the relationship that all each of the four had um, with the mute, um, I I still found it pretty incredible that whole scene between the doctor and and Jake, mm -hmm. where they had that encounter. It went on. It seems like until the morning, all night long, mm -hmm. where they would take breaks and come back again and. You know, I mean, it, first of all, I'm a little bit confused about what was the condition of Dr. Copeland at that point? Was he injured? Had he been injured? He was lying. I think he had consumption. He was, it, consumption. Yeah, but I mean, aside from that, was he? But he had not, also been injured from the jail, when he went to the jailhouse, right? The courthouse. Right. That's what I'm thinking of. Yes, that's right. That's right. So he was he was in a diminished state. He was not well, he, right. Yeah, but and plus he was consumptive. But it didn't stop his um, willingness to to battle. Mm -hmm. The guy was just um, unstoppable. And and then this crazy Jake, who like you know, God knows his how to follow an argument when he was sober, but when he's drunk, he's pulling from every which way, and you're kind of spinning around. I found myself spinning around trying to follow his logic, but uh, he's he kind of like Copeland stays with him, and and then they end up. They're not really even enemies. Pretty extraordinary. To add to, to Robert and Mark's thoughts, uh, I, those two characters, Jake and Doc, well, Doc Copeland was only interested in real truths on page 78, and Jake was only interested in pure, honest truth. Right. Page 68. So they, they were the two biggest idealists, but they also seem to have the biggest anger issues. And during yeah. the confrontation, I think they blew each other apart. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so it's a, what, what commentary is that on this kind of hardcore search for truth, maybe in the wrong place, and it doesn't end well. But I know <laughs> what he does. Like you're right. What he does to his family, and you know, poor Portia. I mean, she's the only one who kind of like get, <laughs> sticks it out and tries to be the you know, the link in the family, but well, she's a mess, you know, I mean, she's just a mess. And um, I feel I felt so sorry for her most of the time. But, you know, not so sorry as I did for her brother who had his legs cut off. So uh, there were you know, some shocking moments in this book, I have to say. 
I think Portia brought another dimension in, a, in addition to being a mess and, and with all of the family problems and obviously her brother and the conflict, she was also somewhat of a link between the two, the two communities, between oh, yeah. the yes. Afro-American community and the white community. And it shows some of, some of the interplay that in, in lots of ways, she was a part of the family where she was working as a cook in the kitchen. That's right. Um, so while the racial tension was extraordinarily realistic and, and I think well brought out, it, it was also this subtle thing of you, you could see people knowingly or unknowingly moving toward each other and she was sort of the central part of that, I thought, which was kind of a, and, and it, it, I, I guess as, as Robert said, there were so many avenues that you could go down in this book, uh, you, you could get lost. Uh, but right. she, well, she may avenue, have been one of them. One avenue I would really like to talk about was is economics. Not only, as someone uh, in the group said, are these people all outsiders, mm -hmm. they don't have any money. And this is, you know, not this a uh, society novel. We're not in the world of Edith Wharton, are we? We're no. in a world in which people are counting out pennies and uh, there's so much emphasis on money and what was going on in the 1930s. And the big truth is, of the novel that uh, Blunt and the others are trying to communicate is that capitalism is bad. Right. Oh sure. But she doesn't. She doesn't exactly give them those words. But money is so scarce, um, and so important, so absolutely important. And what what does Singer do for for his living? He works in a jewelry store, right? He's a he polishes the which is an engraver. Of, an engraver. Engraver, yeah. Which is kind of ironic because he doesn't have very much, but he is a very orderly person of, I guess, what could be described as the lower middle class, and um, he has money, but not a lot of it. As uh, uh, Biff has a restaurant, but he's not swimming in money. So I think the, the economics are very, very important in this novel, and I think McCullers does a very, very wise thing. She never spells out what the big truth is. Right. She never says that. She never delivers. She never talks about socialism or communism or anything like that. But she talks about the 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 truth, the big truth that these people are trying to communicate and to wake up others about. So Do, uh, does anyone want to talk about I think that? That's aspect? another dimension of the title, the mute. Go ahead. I just think that's another dimension of the. Uh, the idea of the mute, that it's the powerless, the, uh, you know, that everyone is kind of muted by capitalism and they're all kind of living these meaningless lives because they're, uh, they're repressed by the whole system. Miriam, I think it's so true, if, if, particularly when you talk, uh, listen to the mother and how she tamps down all of mixed dreams because dreams are expensive. You yeah. know, a piano yeah. is expensive there too to go away to school, to do something. All these things take things that they don't have. They don't have. And isn't it extraordinary that she wanders around at night and listens to music that's floating out of somebody's window? You yeah. know, so talk about the outside. There's a wonderful Chekhov story. I think it's called Oysters. Some of you might be familiar with it, in which a little boy is looking into a restaurant window and he's absolutely hungry. You know, the being on the other side of the glass and not being able to have what you want and what you hunger for. But at least uh, in this novel, the window is open and she can hear the music. There, you know, the, the author that we haven't talked about, which is a favorite of mine and a a fellow alumnus uh, of, of, of Marks at uh, Duke University is Reynolds Price. And uh, his, uh, their depiction, particularly of rural North Carolina, and which um, if I stuck a toe out of my hometown of Danville, Virginia, I would have been in rural North Carolina. is very much the same 
Uh, there, I mean, I, I grew up in a textile town, and and it was life is hard, uh, and um, it, there is frequently the quest was even in the fifties and sixties for those people that worked in the textile mill. There was frequently the question between uh, rent or food, and. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you refer to people as lint heads? I had to look that up. Well, I, I do remember. Is that a common that. word? Yes, yes, in the in textile mills. Yeah. Lint heads. It turns out that when I got my used copy of the book, someone had put in the very first page a little stick up that says lint heads and gives a page <laughs> reference. <laughs> very cool. I don't cool. what I'm holding up here. Um, but this. This is script from Dan River Mills. My dad there, uh, there it was not the company store when my dad ran it, but that, that uh, our play money growing up was the uh, script that we, uh, when my dad uh, took over the store, uh, found in the, the um, stock room. Uh. Let me ask you if I could, do you think that Singer, is merely a catalyst for the others, or does he really interact with them and change because of his interactions with the others? I don't think he changes. I don't know. I don't. I, I see him as a uh, making, getting some feeling of fulfillment by helping these people, and he's genuine in that. Mm -hmm. wants them to be able to be, feel better or to be able to relieve themselves of some kind of terrible thoughts. But I don't think he's moved in any way. Um, he is stuck with, at the very beginning of the book with his relationship with the Greek and he's stuck at the end of the book with his relationship with the Greek and he doesn't want to live anymore. Yeah. And nothing that's happened in between has changed his mind about that. Yeah. My, my feeling, he was more of a catalyst than... Yeah. It, it was almost like it was going to confession and people could go to him <laughs> that his silence was golden because he couldn't speak. They could express whatever they wanted to express and perhaps they felt they were able to get it out. They knew themselves better and they could walk way better not because of him of what he did but rather simply because he was there as a listening person um, yeah no no penance no penance <laughs> <laughs> <Important>. <laughs> uh, let, let me add to that 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 um singer then could be viewed as a scapegoat so that he 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 changed but not willingly so that he in a sense took on all these confessions of the quad and others and it was too much for him, and hence the suicide. So just to throw that Old Testament word on, onto the character as a possibility. But I, I never was sure that he always understood what everybody was confessing to him. No. Like it seemed like sometimes he didn't know what they were saying, they were just saying it, and he was nodding or, you know, he was there yeah. for them. Especially that, there's that line that's repeated several times, the old feeling that they want, they waited to tell each other things that had never been told before. Yeah. And they sometimes didn't, weren't able to do it. And, and sometimes they, they were. They certainly went on and on and on. I mean, Blunt is a tremendous talker. He just goes on and on and on. I think of Singer as a real character, not just a catalyst. And a character in the sense that uh, he embodies love, absolutely unjudgmental, unconditional love. Mm. That is certainly there. He does no harm to anyone and lives an ordinary life. The thing that was also interesting to me in this novel is a lot of drinking. And uh, at, Day apparently he just you know booze drives him crazy, but Singer lets him come and drink in the apartment, and that sort of took me aback. I thought, wait a second, but um, he doesn't get crazy drunk when he's with Singer. That's for sure. Don't you think it's odd that Singer um, 
has this seems like this background of some kind of money because he doesn't have a very a great job it seems to me engraving and at this and it's i don't know but he never seems at a loss he's always got money to give somebody um everybody considers him and that's the other thing that the, the folks in town that we don't meet but we just hear about all think that he's some they all just imbue him with whatever they feel. He's Russian, or he's, he's he, you know, yeah, or whatever they want. And they, and I think they, you know, that's the that's the curious thing. I think that the the folks in town do that, but I don't think they do it to this in the same way that the four do. But when he four, died, he didn't have money. Like he owed a lot of money. Things were bought on time, and you right. Know, the radio. Yeah. Right. I, I just want to. I think what makes him a character. Go ahead, Mark. I, I think for me, what makes him a character rather than a device is the fact that he has the same uh, compulsive need to focus on, you know, this uh, this Greek mute. Uh, who ha doesn't, <laughs> who has no connection to him really, except for when he's in a kind of really Pavlovian way. So he, he has the same need that everyone else has of him. Right. So he, he would be just the device that everyone reads into and, you know, is this kind of one way thing. But instead, he has the exact same human quality towards this other inexplicable character. Yeah, more unrequited love, right? And I just want to add that he seems calm and he's a peace giver and a peacemaker. But and I, I have missed what page it was, but I think one of the first descriptions of him in the book is that he was with continual turmoil and worry. So he was a conflicted, you know, tumultuous person, but he just didn't show it. Well, his, his, uh, his hand signals apparently were really frenetic. Okay, but, but I'm saying too that like the quad and the others, no. So he really was mute on, on a number of levels. And obviously his turmoil ends in his own, own suicide. But so again, a very deep character. But it seemed, as a person who likes to talk a lot, it seemed to me that he also needed someone to talk to. And that Spiros was the only one he could talk to, the only one who understood his sign language. Mm -hmm. So we all need someone that we can express ourselves to that we feel is listening to us. And the only ones he could really talk to easily, the only one he could talk to easily was Spiros. Well, when That's he wrote true. Spiros letters, Spiros couldn't read them. And then eventually he never even sent Spiros the letters. Like he just wrote them. Exactly. And the things that he wrote in his little little pad with his silver pen were only answers to, to things. They were, or they were explaining something. They were never, you know, self-explanatory. But, but when he saw Spiros, he signed with him and right. he could express himself. No, I know. But he I'm never knew Spiros, if Spiros understood him. Right. Right? Yeah, I guess so. What about music? What about the role of music? Apparently, um, Carson McCullers went to New York to study at Juilliard and didn't have enough money to do it and ended up studying writing at Columbia University. But she always had a love of music. So what role does music play in this? It's, oh, let me just add one thing that um, I saw in some discussion questions that, um, she, Carson McCullers herself described the structure of the novel as a three-part fugue and explained like a voice in a fugue, each one of the main characters is an entity in himself, but his personality takes on a new richness when contrasted and woven in with the other characters. And so what does the music symbolize? Does it feel like a fugue in the sense that she says? I'll, I'll, uh chip something in here. There was a quote that I, I that particularly struck me on page 118, and it's Mick um, saying, wonderful music like this was the worst hurt there could be. 
And it reminds me, there's a, a lady named Pia Melody who, who was asked once, what is the definition of a spiritual moment? And her response was, well, there's two perhaps. One is a joy, is joy-filled sadness, and the other is sadness-filled joy. So pure joy and pure sadness are not spiritual. And so for young Mick, it seems like music was just that. So it could be both wonderful and full of hurt. It's a wonderful quotation from uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, glad to the brink of fear, which I think sums it up. Just absolutely wonderful. Glad to the brink of fear. Also music uh, was very, an area of, of freedom and pleasure in this novel. And innovation. Yes. So that you- Like a world. Yeah, you could and be, also unrequited, right? <laughs> she couldn't get the piano lessons. She couldn't make the violin. Yeah. But she did get to go to the gym and play piano. <laughs> which was the weirdest place to put so, it together. I time. think you, I, I found it, I find it really interesting, you know, this thing that you pointed out about the, the title. And I, cause I really do think that, uh, that that's, you know, I see that this liberating role for the, the young, you know, Mick character um, with the music. And I feel like, uh, you know, that's saying something really profound from the author's point of view um, about the, uh, you know, th this language that is, you know, able to really speak in terms, speak the truth of emotions in a, and have depth and fulfillment in a way that is, uh, you know, beyond what normally is there in, in front of, you know, people. So, um, so I really think that the, in some way, the music is kind of a counterpoint to the idea of muteness. Mm. It was also so heartbreaking when, in her frustration, when she's trying to figure out how she can put this down in some way that she can retrieve it. And she, she makes these giant lines, like huge lines, and she does a, a clef and puts a few notes in it and then she does this very fancy signature at the bottom and this was her first effort to make real what was in her head and it was like it was so poignant and um it just made me sad that when she when she just that it's not that she left it behind it's that it fell away all that fell away when the realities of her life just hit her because she couldn't articulate what she wanted to with the music. Yeah. And I think exactly. everybody had a difficulty articulating what they wanted, right? Right. But I mean, this was, this was like, she knew only a little bit about musical notation. Mm -hmm. And she took the emblematic parts of it and tried to use them to indicate where she wanted to go. And it was, it was futile, but it was so heartfelt. I don't know. It just really touched me. I had another thought. Uh, I have a friend, a writer friend, and I wish I had written to him before, but I, about this character of Mr. Singer. I wonder, uh, th this writer friend of mine is very, is disabled and very involved in the disability movement. And I'm wondering what he would have to say about the noble Mr. Singer, whether it would be a problem for him. Uh, that uh, McCullers takes what would be called a, a disabled person and elevates him to a kind of sainthood. Is that a denial somehow of his, of Singer's completeness? I don't know. I'm going to email Kenny tonight and ask him <laughs> what he might think about that. Uh, Just to answer, does anyone have a, a sense of that, how they feel about that point? about elevating a disabled person? Well, I don't know, but I mean, 
I don't think Carson McCullers was a Catholic writer, although she may have been. But I'm I'm going from what I know of uh, Flannery O'Connor, mm -hmm. and what I also, as a person with the two degrees in Catholic theology, um, the the kind of ridiculous notion the Church has about how to look at gay and lesbian people, and how they they should use their talents, which is basically anonymously, like they can't yes. they can't have sex, they can't they can't live with somebody they love, or they can't get married, but they but they can um, they can do amazing things because of the gifts that they're given, and this this would probably allow in the church's sense to elevate him to a you know some kind of spiritual high ground because he's making use of this weak so-called weakness yeah. or handicap what do you think marion i don't know it's a very very good point i know the church the church wants uh the gay to be mute in a sense yeah yeah and useful right Right, that they, you know, that they can, uh, they have an ability to um, feel deeply, and they can be compassionate, and yeah. they can, you know. All of that. All that. So in that sense, the church isolates people from one another, right? So you're not supposed to be with this group or that group. What about isolation in general? What factors... You know, the book has been widely praised for illustrating how different factors isolate people. Well, so in what ways, please, go ahead. So I want to talk a little about isolation and what efforts does each character make to overcome this isolation? Well, there's a wonderful scene in, at the beginning when Biff is with his wife, who, you know, later dies and she's very interested she just wants him to kick out the kick blunt out of the restaurant and she's very interested in money and and all of that and he says to her i mean there's such a split between the two of them talk about isolation and you get a sense how lonely he is in this marriage he says you know you're not curious about anything <laughs> <laughs> which i think was so wonderful so they are very, very much separated, you know, very, very much separated. I um, think it's in that part, he also says something to the effect, I don't have the exact quote, I like flawed people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's almost impossible to like people if you don't like flawed people, because <laughs> I don't know any that aren't flawed, but um, to say that so eloquently, yeah. So, I, I don't know if this gets to, to your isolation question, but I just wanted to go back briefly to Mick, uh, who again, I found the most fascinating. Uh, I, I'm a little less pessimistic about her because like most coming of age books about a writer or a creative type, even though we, she ends on a down note, all right, okay, some good, and she's just uh, you know, uh, working to help out the family at the retail store, since I take her to be the autobiographical figure of the author, I have the hope that Mick went on to better things, right? So that's, that, that may be my reading, but that tends to be the trajectory of coming of age stories about writers or creative types. Now her isolation, and interestingly, she had, she had huge dreams. And I think it was the music that, that, that brought that, that opened up a whole world to her to make, make her think really big. And one of the most beautiful uh, uh, sort of young uh, moments, epiphanies almost, uh, that, that the author covers is on page 250 for me in which, talking about Nick, it was like she could knock down all the walls of the house and then march through the streets big as a giant. <laughs> yes. so, so she was just a marvelous young lady coming into her own she was held back by the end, but I don't think, you know, I, I think she went on to bigger and better things. I just wanted to put out there. Oh, I hope so. That's interesting. I didn't think so. Um, I there I sort of got uh, pictured her like, a, remember in My Antonia when he meets her again, and she's, she's you know, she she's lost her beauty and so forth. I thought thought at when she went into 
worked with with the dime store and there you know uh basically um you know they, they had robbed her of all her promise and all her hopes yeah and i thought she would probably got pregnant by Harry because a few times she was not feeling well as this was going on. And then I thought she would get together with Biff because Biff wanted children, right? And he always had this attraction for her. And that was right. kind of left for years in the future or months in the future. A sequel that never happened. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. But what do you think about the, the sort of int intimations of um homosexuality with with him um his affect who Biff? yeah yeah i love that i love that fluidity of that yeah putting on the perfume yeah. putting on his wife's perfume and then blount um smelling it and being like what is that and he's like yeah, oh, no. yeah. The aftershave <laughs> and he's and the fact that he's um He's so, it's not even, they wouldn't use the word closeted, but he's unaware of who he might be. But he's also demonstrating things that are known to be characteristics of gay men. Very observant. But he was also attracted to Mick, right? Yeah, but he was also, you know, she was very She boring. was also a tomboy. She right. was a boy, yeah. Tomboy, and yeah. he's very observant. I mean, obviously he's trying to keep the till, keep somebody's hand out of the till, but he's watching everything and everybody, every conversation that anybody's having with Singer and the table and where, and where everybody's, he's just constantly aware. So who knows? It's there, it's definitely there. Yeah. yeah. What about other factors about isolation? Mm. Does anyone wanna talk more about that? Mm. Oh. I think the whole book is isolation. That's what a lonely hunter is all about. Lonely, yeah. Yeah. Can somebody help help me out with? Um, I get I got really confused with the doctor's children and those names that he gave them, and who Hamilton turned into, and who Karl Marx turned into Buddy. I think yeah. um, Willie stayed Willie, I think, but then, it, yeah, anyway, it, was that confusing to anybody else? Oh, see, I thought that was a fascinating thing where he wanted his children to be one thing and, and they, they chose a whole different identity. Uh, right, but I found it hard to connect them afterwards. <laughs> I didn't know which one was which. Well, sometimes I felt like the doctor had that same trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he did. Wasn't it extraordinary, the class differences? The doctor had sort of uh, risen to a, a, a higher class, so to yeah. speak, and his language was different, and the children were just country people. Yeah. You know, just absolutely country people and uh, so separated by class. Yeah. That's but, isolation too. And that's the isolation. The doctor is the most isolated figure. Mm. Even but again, he's, he's out with everybody all day, right? He's making yeah. all these calls all day. They're all isolated, but they're all very social. And even though he has a higher educational status and a higher perhaps social status, when it comes time for him to see the judge, the judge won't see him because he's black. Right. Or the sheriff won't let him be see the judge. So can we talk a little bit about the racial component and her sensitivity to the racial tensions and a little bit about that relevance today at a time of Black Lives Matters? Well, I, I can say one thing right off the bat. The so-called screed idea or the screeds that the doctor goes through are so unbelievably on point. Mm -hmm. They're so about the connectedness of the enforced poverty. Why are people looked down upon because they don't have stuff? Because they never had any stuff in the first place and they never were allowed to have the ability to acquire stuff. And it's so exactly what the arguments are about today. And um, one of them, I made, I made a note of a couple of them, but you know which ones they are. 
but he, he these really long ones, like especially when he gets the small group of, of uh, Negroes together and he's giving this big talk and he gets all sweaty and all worked up, but it's amazingly powerful. I mean, forget, you know, the, what's his name on CNN or MSNBC, Juana <laughs> Brawley's, you know, favorite pastor. This guy was unbelievably strong and powerful and right. I think he was right. And, and the, just a, the, the doctor, um, I think was the biggest misanthrope uh, 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 among them. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and one thing that he, he, he you know, called him the biggest chip on his shoulder. Yeah. And it was the eugenic parenthood for the Negro race. Which is kind of a contradiction. So he, he was a eugenic parenthood for the Negro race. Pretty much, he was saying there have to be fewer Negroes. Um, and so he was a somewhat twisted guy. The right. He said he said take care of the ones who are born, right, and yeah. don't right. have more. Yeah. But to call himself <laughs> eugenic, <laughs> the but eugenics is a pretty tough thing to call yourself. Uh, so what he was talking about but maybe like, not in the 30s. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it maybe brings out something else, too, that there, there's a book which is called Anatomy of a Revolution. It was written by a gentleman by the name of Crane Britton. And the thesis is that the underclass hardly ever starts a revolution um, because they don't have the aspiration to move toward a revolutionary meaning. Um, and, and I think maybe that's true in the doctor as well. He, within, within his group, he is not the underclass. He is the more of the intellectual class that has aspirations that get frustrated that leave him, lead him to be more revolutionary. Um, and and I, th I think that's pointed out in the book that while he's trying to convince people, listen to me, let me tell you, what it is, and again, seeking what the real truth is. Um, revolutions are a very difficult thing to get started. And, um, and I think Crane Britton was right. They normally don't start with, with the whole masses of folks. They, they start with a spark with somebody like a Trotsky or like a Lenin or like a Mao Tse Tung um, or like a Martin Luther King. The, these people were not and this sounds horribly classist, but and I don't mean it that way. But they they were not economically in a lower class. They they had moved well beyond that, so that intellectually they could they could visualize what could be, and that led to frustration. And, and I think that was manifested in the character of the doctor as well. Yeah, in, in some cases, in some sense, he was kind of a circular firing squad. I mean, he just his frustration mm -hmm. levels became were so articulated in the text where he'd, get, he'd start to feel this rumbling and then he would try to push it down and then he would come up and then he would burst out and then he would just be pointlessly angry and then it would take him forever to calm down again. And this was like, it was really just self so self-destructive and, and also destructive of his whole family and the relationships with all of his children and his yeah, wife. He, he didn't talk to them anymore and he got separated, yeah. Yeah. If I can add also to Doreen's question about race relations, and it, it might, might tie in, there was a, a Jake stumbles upon one of the, the uh, Old Testament uh, graffiti on a wall uh, on page 159 here, which is, ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, which is Ezekiel 13, 18. And what, what Ezekiel is talking about is the, the war of Gog and Magog, which is at the end of times. And I think what, what uh, uh, this brilliant author is getting at is that in this case, it's class warfare, right, that Jake is talking about, uh, but there's also race against race. So in a sense, the two biggest conflicts of, of, of this book uh, are uh, kind of intimated to be what eventually pulls us all apart and, and down. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I got so I nervous when I heard that 
when I heard that uh, Mick had done something with a red crayon, I thought, oh no, she can't have been the one who did that. <laughs> but of course it wasn't. Yeah. Do you remember she did something with a red crayon and it's the first time red was mentioned since that passage? Yeah. I think she, she added a graffiti that was about one of her private parts, if I remember correctly. <laughs> That's right. So how, just as a question of time here, how can we go as long as we want or what time do, are we uh, trying to? We're, we're good, I, I, at least another half hour. And I think okay, that will extend if we wish to. Okay, just wanted to check with the time here. So on the race, um, what is it about the book that makes it stand out so much, that makes it so relevant? What, what has she captured here? That so many books from that time we don't read, but that she really, uh, it remains so relevant. Well, I just think she's not judgmental about anybody. Everybody is represented to the best and worst, but it's kind of all truthful and um, she doesn't pull any punches. It's just telling the story and she's fair to everybody and she's honest and I think she's pretty accurate, which is kind of unusual. And I mean, when you find out that she's 23, it becomes absolutely miraculous. I don't know how somebody, I mean, you know, you can't be, tw you can't be 16 years old and write about taking a plane around the world without, you know, having a huge imagination and reading a lot, doing a lot of research. But she writes very casually about things that would have been done by people much older than her. And she has a sort of insider knowledge about all of it. I don't know, maybe she was just unbelievably observant um, or I don't know, maybe she had older friends. I don't know what her world was like, but man, was she good. At just, to, just to add to Robert Robert's observation, I think what attracts is obviously the coming of age story is, is always of interest to any generation. So that's nice seeing Nick grow up uh, and hopefully her creative uh, blossoming. Uh, you know, so that's always inspiring. But then, as I mentioned, I found it amazing that this young lady who wrote this was did it without stereotypes and as uh, any of her characters, because they're all relatively complex, right? And as Jay mentioned, the, the number of subjects <laughs> that get touched upon in this book are really amazing. Uh, so, so in a sense, it's, it's Singer. You can read into this book whatever you want to. <laughs> I love, too, the idea of the promenade, right? And I, I didn't realize, like, prom came from walking down the blocks yeah. with someone. That right. was great. Yeah. love that. Yeah. Yeah, and Harry was a fascinating character. I, I, really, I wanted to see more of him, but he decided to move on. He ditched. He was out well, of Well, I think, you think he was afraid of fatherhood? You think he really... He was afraid of his mother. Well, wow, that, of. yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. Being the only Jew in town, gosh. No, but people said Singer was a Jew. People said a lot of people were Jews. That came up yeah. a lot. Well, if they're at all mysterious, they're Jewish. Then they were Jews, yeah. yeah. Me, I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I know McCleary puts it off, but how about Esther Littman? <laughs> Grandmother. <laughs> you know, let, let's look a little bit at this term relevant. Um, when we when we use the word relevant and we ask that question, is this novel relevant? Usually what it means is, is does that connect to uh, today's political issues or economic issues or social issues? Mm -hmm. And then there's another way, uh, and uh, I would say, why worry about that? Isn't there something universal? So Ben mentioned the coming of age novel. Yes, the, the, the look at personalities, the, the, all of that um, takes it, I think, to a different level. Because if you nail it down to the issues of today, maybe it will help us 
relate to the novel and say, oh, well, this is relevant. Look what's going on in America now with Black Lives Matter and everything. But suppose Black Lives Matter was not going on. And suppose all, you know, this is unlikely, suppose all those issues of, uh, of race suddenly uh, were, were solved in this country and somebody picked up the novel and, the, and, and they'd say, well, what's going on with the black people here? Why is the doctor so angry? That's not happening anymore. So I don't think, well, I don't think uh, it's always the best thing to, to ask that question about relevancy, because times change. What's so relevant about Hamlet? We don't have kings very much anymore. There's not too many monarchies anymore. Uh, well, I, I guess so I find Hamlet relevant. very relative. But... Hamlet's not relevant. Yes, he is. In terms of, if you want to connect it to social issues, Hamlet's not relevant anymore. I, I think to be to, to be or not to be is very relevant. Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, Shakespeare is not relevant anymore because you know it has it's not connected to any social issue. But if we say, what are the universal qualities in this book that are so interesting? One of the you things that I think get it to it another is, level. I'm not saying off. we should close those other things off, because very often there are a way we can get into a book. Well, I mean, I guess I'm the I'm not really understanding the the question of relevancy. I think the interesting thing to me is mm -hmm. that the book, and and it was my own experience growing up in the South. Is right now. I mean, the book, you see an intertwined, uh, the relationships that go across the color line. What I found in the 60s is that uh, when you would have thought after the civil rights movement and so forth, uh, instead of a, um, there, a full integration uh, there is that the lines really did become more and more separate. And I would say now, that for most of us here, there, that that, um, that that really is a very segregated life that we live. Um, uh, there, I doubt we we really do uh, understand the uh, the issues uh, of the Black Lives Matter like Mick would have understood the issues um, there, that she saw with the doctor, with the, 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 uh, his daughter and his family, um, because he, he knew them and uh, he knew parts of their lives. I think more and more if we, uh, we, we are uh, more, you know, uh, in fact, I think schools now have basically resegregated um, public schools. We're more isolated. And more isolated. Well, and, I would disagree with that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at young people today, they're much more mm, mixed race, much more uh, multicultural. I don't know if that's true about segregation. What I would say is that things like social media and... Um, <laughs> have made us more isolated in our little circles, whatever they might be, but I don't know if it's necessarily racial. Well, the education department says that schools are more segregated now, that, that they have gone back to segregation. Well, don't believe Betsy DeVos, everything you hear from her. Oh, no, no, this is from the Obama <laughs> days, so, so I mean, and so forth. So, I mean, I really do think, I mean, maybe it is in some ways a aspect of economic class, um, yeah, I, I think going to relevance is, maybe the relevance is that she's describing what was, not, not just in the case of, of the black community, um, but as has been pointed out, in the case of a depression, in the case of a lack of money, in the case of almost an industrial revolution with the mill, getting becoming the head of the town and then that would become a, that would erode as well 
So maybe, maybe it has a historical relevance of saying, okay, at this particular time, this was one cut of how a part of a society looked, not all of it, but a part of it. And the relevance perhaps is to compare, okay, how was it and how is it? And maybe, maybe that's the more relevant part of it um, as opposed to that it solves, in fact, it, it doesn't really even talk about a problem. It simply describes a society. Um, and, and I think it, if you say that is one cut of what was happening in one town in Georgia and say, okay, how is it now? How, is it, how has it changed for better or for worse? And, and maybe that's where the relevance comes in, perhaps. I think that if you look at the argument between the doctor and Jake, on the, in the I think with the shared edition that that we we two have on 297, um, Jake is having engaged in that argument with the doctor, and he says there are corporations worth billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of people who don't get to eat, and then he says here in these 13 states, and I'm not sure why they talk about 13 states, but. The exploitation of human beings is so that that it's a thing you got to take in with your own eyes. In my life, I seen things that would make a man go crazy. At least one third of all Southerners live and die no better than the lowest peasant in any European fascist state. I mean, this is, it's still true. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. When I, I yeah, when we read also about the immigrants who were working in meat processing yes. yeah and can i just can i just add uh, uh it, this might not be talking about relevance but then trying to apply some of maybe the universal truths that, that i think uh the author came up with to all of our current situations speaking of isolation we have just come off of and some of us start still are in the most major isolating event in world history the quarantine and I don't know about you guys, but I think we are all experts right now in lonely hunting. <laughs> right, and I, and I think that brings to mind that yearning, right? That yearning for connection that all the characters, all those main four plus one characters, they're just yearning for that connection. And whether it's a legitimate connection because maybe Singer doesn't understand what they're saying or he's just there and not really reciprocating that, it's still that yearning for that connection that, that I think we all do. And I think that's relevant mm -hmm. in times of isolation or not. We're, we're pretty much in quarantine in Concord, New Hampshire. I mean, the streets are full of people with masks on. Uh, the library is closed except for, for pickup. Pick They've got a big plexiglass booth outside the library. You either by email or by phoning call in your book selections and then you make an appointment and you go to the library and you pick up your book and it's like, you know, a bank teller and it's the book is slipped through at the bottom of this pl uh, plexiglass shield. All the library workers are in masks. And of course, I go the other day to pick up a book. I've got my mask on and somebody behind the plexiglass shield says to me, hi, Miriam. And my heart actually began to thump. And I Aww. said, well, that hasn't happened in months where I just go out. We're not even talking about a deep, she said, oh, it's Robin. I said, hi, Robin, it's great to see you. And we chatted briefly. There's also that web of connection that when you just go out on the street and you see somebody or you see somebody walking a dog and you talk about the dog, you may not know them all that well. That's all pretty much disappeared from my life. Yeah. I have, yeah. A, I have a friend who just got her hair colored. Yeah. And she lives by herself. And she said it was amazing. It was the first time she was touched by another human being in yeah. four months. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I smiled at somebody at the supermarket the other day and I realized I'm not sending any smile out. They can't see a thing. And see. No. So we're sort of smiling with our eyes. Our eyes. Right. <laughs> exactly. Rock. And I had sung I had sunglasses on, so there you go. <laughs> so you had your sunglasses on. Yeah, and living on South Beach in particular, and 
so used to meeting so many strangers. And uh, yeah. for the first time in many months, I met someone new. And that was like, wow, I'm so used to meeting new people all the time. And that's, that's not that's been the wonderful. case lately. And, yeah, I'm in that neighborhood too. And I would go to Flamingo Park very often. And I would meet people that I had never known before. We would chat. And I got very friendly with the security guy, Lorenzo, on his bicycle. We became quite friendly and everything. I know him. You know Lorenzo? <laughs> oh, he's terrific. Yeah. Lorenzo he's is a wonderful guy. And... Uh, so all of that, that, that web of connection, you know, it's just pretty much evaporated. I mean, I see my next door neighbor and we chat from a distance. Uh, I had my walk today and people just do a beeline away to keep the distance. Yeah. Um, Can I just say how lucky we are to be connecting over literature. Over literature and, and over <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. Imagine yeah. even 15 years ago, mm. had we had this quarantine, none of us could be having these kinds of connections that we're having. That's We'd have to use uh, Dixie cups with string. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all live on Meridian, so we're close enough, a bunch of us. <laughs> but maybe I used the wrong word, relevant. Perhaps I meant popular. Um, mm in terms of like that universal concept of all of us looking for a connection. Mm -hmm. And what I, one of the things I loved about the book was that the connection wasn't only through love, like you're saying here, our connection is through love of literature, but like those building of communities. There's so some people tried to find it in church. Some people tried to find it in race. Mm -hmm. Some people tried to find it in politics, um, whether it was communism or labor organizing. Um, some people tried to find it in science. Um, and just like the different levels that we try and find connection. And they were all in the book. Like every pathway that you could possibly go down. Sexuality. Um, even just like opening your cafe all night long, even though nobody comes to offer connection in any way that you can, even to the guy who's not gonna pay you. Um, mm -hmm. Just that eternal search. And to me, that was like, you call it the yearning. Um, for me, it was like, where do we find connection? If we can't always have requited love, how do we build community? And, and what I loved in part was that she didn't give easy answers. Mm -hmm. She just, described the search well and, and that's what robert pointed out at the very beginning there's first of all she's remarkable at 23 and secondly she went down so many different avenues in one book um, I, I think maybe moving away from the relevance and all and moving back to her she, she was a pretty incredible author um, you know just uh, this may be too big a can to open this late but um, I just had a, a thought about, you know, authors and their their impetus to, in, the, in their storytelling to um, introduce su surprising things that seem to throw the whole thing off track. Uh, I think I'm with John Irving, you know, like mm -hmm. coming down the hill with his kids and then hitting his wife, giving a BJ to her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I mean, how that changes their lives. But I mean, the whole thing of the baby being shot. Oh my God. I mean, that was, first of all, I knew it was gonna happen half a page before when they talked about the rifle because- You don't bring in a rifle, check out. You know, yeah. if, there's some, if there's a gun mentioned in the first yeah. paragraph, it's gonna be used in a short story <laughs> at the end. Right. But it was so shocking. And then the repercussions that it had for the family and, and oh. her, her relationship, re, uh, mixed relationship with her brother and the chase and the police looking and everything and the family and then and then finding him hiding and then and then the repercussions with the woman who doesn't forgive them but the mother and then says here's what you have to do you have to basically go into total debt to pay for my daughter to have a first class room i mean the but whole they shot her daughter you say that like it's bad but they he shot her daughter <laughs> no, I know, I know. Oh, no, I don't think it's, I'm not talking about it being a just thing. I'm just talking about why would it have happened that, that way? 
why would that be something that she would want to have happen in this book to cause mm -hmm. yeah. these these tidal waves of change? Right, I think to show how precarious life is, right? Yeah, and, and maybe it really actually happened. Who knows? Yeah. But I mean, didn't you think at first that she was just dead? Yeah. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. But they were BBs. We knew they were BBs. In the yeah, game. yeah. Yeah. And then, but then you know, they, later on, she she can't have her movie career because her mother thinks that she can't well, throw her hair back and babies, yeah, <laughs> baby. <laughs> she was pretty obnoxious. The pretty one. She's the very pretty one. I'm yeah, like, little Shirley Temple, right? Yeah. Everything pink. Oh, well, everyone, now that Miriam has her truth uh, t-shirt on, I think. You can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention before anyone uh, thinks of fading away is that uh, early in August, Miriam is going to be leading our next uh, book club meeting. Uh, and so I just want to put in a plug. If Melissa and Jay, if you want to uh, join, then find a way to get your email to me and I'll send you the email with everything. So it'll have what the What's book the is. next book? Yes, but well, it's actually a couple of stories. Miriam, do you want to mention them again? I forgot the name of the Please, let me mention those. Uh, the, there are two short stories by Catherine Mansfield. Uh, one is called Prelude and the other one is called At the Bay. And you can get them online. If you just go either, they're, they're out of copyright and they're widely available, so you don't even have to buy the book. Well, right. when I say, when I send the email, it actually has links to them, so it, it makes it super easy. You don't even have to search. But I will need your emails in order to to uh, send that good info to you and the Zoom invite, all those things. Sorry, Miriam, go ahead. So I would love to uh, have you read them. They're wonderful stories, and they're full of atmosphere. Full of atmosphere, and I know there are going to be a lot of things that we're going to talk about. And what is the date for that? Uh, August. To what is it? Uh, it's the first Friday of the month, and that okay. will be the seventh, sure. August seventh. Great. So, um, just to go around one more time, is there anything? Uh, shall we go around? Is there any final comments anyone would like to make before we? say goodbye about the book and or this conversation or I would just like to say thank you Doreen for a terrific choice and for leading us so well that was right. just awesome. a oh, sure. way to connect yeah. thanks and the question yeah. Yeah, there we go all right Woo. Aww, thank you sorry yeah. David you were saying uh, the, it was a great choice and the questions beforehand were terrific they really were they're, uh, that they were really good. Yeah. They were meaty. Yeah. I won't take credit for that. There's book group discussion questions, and I kind of adapted them. So all I did was research like the journalist I've long been. Uh, well, uh, that, well, thank you for doing, your, uh, doing all our homework <laughs> from there. I will suggest, if you haven't read it. Somebody's uh, got to do it. Is <laughs> uh, Kate Baden by Reynolds Price. Uh, a look at a uh, 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 a young woman coming of age in the South, uh, uh, about 20 years, written about 20 or 25 years later. It's a wonderful... Uh, uh, What's beautiful. the title? It's called Kate Baden, B-A-I-D-E-N. It's a great album. Uh, I've heard a, about it, Reynolds Price, but I've never read it. Oh, Reynolds Price, sure. Uh, I would just like to add one thing, if I may. I had been telling my boyfriend about the book and he said, oh, is there a movie? Let's watch the movie. I don't know if you guys discussed this at all. Don't watch the movie. No. <laughs> um, it's so bad. She's so bad. blonde. So, I can't believe so that Mick, bad. I never thought Mick was this little debutante blonde girl, but there she is in the movie. The characters are not well developed. Jake leaves like way early in the movie. Biff is almost not at all there. The whole town seems like richer and 
there's no hardly any talk about fascism, oh. communism, ideology, uh, or any of the other ideas. We'll be done. No. Okay. Uh, don't don't waste your time. Hey, well, thank you for that. Tip. Well, that makes me want to go see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, Contrary. It's so disappointing. Like I had to stop it halfway through and just say, wait, wait this isn't the book I read. This is like a really bad version. Why did they, I, I saw parts of it and I, I don't, it was just sort of the choice, like why did they move him right out of town to go uh, there for the asylum? I mean, it seemed to uh, just sort of shoot the plot in the foot to, at the beginning. I don't know how you felt, but that's from there. Completely, and Spiros is not grotesque. He's kind of comical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like all the things in your mind of, and all the richness of it is just reduced to something. Well, it, it's such a complex book. It's really hard to duplicate in a movie. Yes. It really is. Yes. The book is always better. Before we sign <laughs> off, I, I would like to add, uh, it, I think it was uh, from E.M. Forrester's Howard's End, uh, ladies and gentlemen, only connect. Yeah. Okay, uh, so here- I, I want to say one last, one last thing. Somebody, a character that nobody mentioned, and there's a reason because he is so minor, Charles Parker. Do you remember him? Cousin. He's the guy, he's that ran the general store. Oh, and who puts like, heroes in? He's so weird, and he just appears like <laughs> twice. <laughs> and everybody's afraid to go in, they don't want to deal with him. It's very funny. Anyway. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. All. Thank nice to meet you all. Look forward to seeing you all in person, or if not, then right back here. You know. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay well. Bye -bye. Good night. Stay well. Yeah.